Episode 15, Chapter 14 Chapter 14 Their return to the city was much easier than climbing the mountain had been. Link rappelled down the cliffsides with Sidon's help while Cass simply glided down on his large wings. After Link was secure on the ground, Sidon would let the rope fall for him to gather before diving off the waterfall or, once, somehow sliding down the falls, feet first, in a fast, but controlled descent. Well, it seems that someone noticed that I was gone, Sidon said thoughtfully after they climbed down the final cliff and began towards the bridge leading into the city. Evening was beginning to fall, and Link saw that the mouth of the bridge was occupied by several anxious-looking Zoro with holding staffs with glowing blue tips aloft. Link recognized several of them as being from the same group that had accompanied Sidon the day prior. To Link's dismay, he saw that some of the older Zora that had shown him scorn were present as well. Prince Sidon The one named Segan called as the three stepped into view. Others echoed the call, and several of the younger Zora, Baz included, rushed forward to greet the prince. There was a moment of confusion as multiple Zora began speaking at once, all seemingly demanding answers for why Sidon had gone with Link. Finally, Sidon held up his hands, speaking in a firm, regal tone. Enough. The voices around him died, and he gave a satisfied smile. I decided to go with Link to slay the Lionel. Segan turned to Link, holding his spear in a tight grip. His expression was murderous. After what you did to Mipha, you dare endanger another of the royal family. I should end you where you stand. Sidon swiftly moved to stand between Link and the older Zora, reaching out and placing a hand on Segan's shoulder. I went of my own volition, Segan. Link did not encourage this. In fact, he actively tried to discourage it. But Prince Sidon, your father forbade you from. I am well aware of my father's commands, thank you, Sidon said, his tone cooling some. Well, Baz said, his expression and tone growing hopeful. Did you do it? Is the Lionel dead? Sidon smiled and glanced back over his shoulder. Link. Link pulled the Lionel's quiver of shock arrows from his shoulder and held it aloft for the gathered Zora to see. There was a moment of silence as all considered the meaning of this trophy, which was followed by a cheer from the younger Zora, as well as several of the older. Baz and the other Zora that Link had once known gathered closer, several of them slapping Link or Sidon on the back and congratulating them on their victory. Segan and a few of the other elders still looked disgruntled, but none of them had any other objections to speak aloud. The deed had been done, and the trio had been victorious. Together, the procession began back across the bridge while Cass began telling those who wished to hear the tale of their victory. Link noticed that the Cass embellished the fight somewhat, not only making Link's own actions sound that much more heroic but speaking very highly of Sidon's own contributions as well. Absently, Link wondered if this tale would still be told in a hundred years, as the story of the last Lionel he vanquished with Mipha was. He supposed that it would depend on whether or not he succeeded in saving them all from the Divine Beast. When they reached the city, it would seem that the news of their victory had not yet spread unsurprising, considering that the only ones aware of their return were present with Link and Sidon. Still, though, it seemed to Link that there was an air of anticipation over the city. Several Zora stood near the bridge, who whispered amongst themselves as the group passed. Link could not hear their whispers, but he had an idea of what they pertained. They returned from the line ill. Alive. It likely meant only one thing. The group dispersed as they reached the city. Now that Sidon was safely returned, most of them were no longer needed and would return to their families or guard positions. Link imagined that the news of their victory would spread quickly. When they finally reached the palace, Sidon chose to enter first, explaining to Link that he would explain his own actions before calling Link in. Link was left outside with Baz and Segan. The older Zora still wanted nothing to do with Link and went to stand at the opposite side of the entrance. Baz stepped closer to Link, glancing at Segan and then smiling down at him. So, what was it like? The Lionel? Link looked up at Baz, seeing a youthful excitement there. He wished that he could remember their childhood friendship. Finally, he said, it was big. Baz laughed and began prodding Link for more details, which he reluctantly gave, making sure to emphasize Sidon's contributions in the battle. For all that Link had done, Sidon's actions likely saved his life. After a few minutes, Link and Cass were both summoned inside. The chamber within was largely empty, with the exception of King Dory Fan, Sidon to his right, and Muzo to his left. The older Zora scowled at Link when he entered, which Link tried to ignore, focusing, instead, on Dorefan's smiling face. Welcome, my friend, King Dory Fan said, leaning forward as Link entered. 
My son tells me that you have been victorious in your quest. That is twice now that you have slain such a creature in service for the Zora a feat that will most certainly be recorded in our histories for generations of Zora to come. Link stepped up onto the dais, bowing respectfully. Thank you, your majesty, he said, trying to keep his voice neutral. He truly wasn't sure how to address royalty. Distantly, he wondered how he had addressed Princess Zelda while traveling with her. Did they have the kind of easy camaraderie that Sidon had with his guards? It should be noted, though, that Prince Sidon did much to help defeat the Lionel as well. I do not know if I could have done it without his help. Link paused, considering. And it was he that finally put an end to its life. Out of the corner of his eye, Link saw Sidon smile. Oh, I think it was well and dying before I put it out of its misery, he said, though Link heard a distinct note of pride in his voice. Dory Fan glanced towards Sidon and then back at Link. Finally, he laughed. To hear my son tell it, he did very little, yet you say that he was instrumental in the victory. Humility is an admirable trait in anyone, though, perhaps, misplaced when speaking to a king looking for ways to reward you for your deeds. And, as for my son's actions, though I cannot say that I approve of his disobedience, King Dory Fan looked towards Sidon, whose smile faded. I also cannot deny the service rendered by both of you. Reckless, it may have been, I can hardly blame him. It is the duty of a king to protect his people, after all. You shall make a good king one day, Sidon. Sidon seemed to swell at this praise, looking up at his father gratefully. Thank you, father, though not any time soon, I would hope. I should hope not. King Dory Fan laughed before turning his attention back towards Link and Cass. And, minstrel, I understand that you accompanied them in order to witness the deed. I did, your majesty, Cass said, inclining his head respectfully. I hope that I may one day hear the song that will come of this day, then. Cass smiled. I have already begun composing it in my head, your majesty. I will certainly return to play it for you when I have it completed. Excellent. King Dory Fan clapped his massive hands together and his demeanor changed subtly. He seemed more relaxed all of a sudden, and his tone, when he spoke next, had dropped some of the regality. Muzo, you have the armor. I do, your majesty, Musa said, his voice tense. But are you sure you wish to give this to him? It is a treasure to the Zora, after all, and he... It is his, Dory Fan said. She made it for him. You know this. I am still not convinced. We have already discussed this. I wish to give it to Link, as Mipha wanted. I dare say that I know my daughter's intentions better than you. As he watched the exchange between them, Link found himself confused. Armor? Mipha? He didn't know what to make of it all. Finally, Muzo, chastised, turned and retrieved a neatly folded bundle of clothing. Sitting atop it was a simple headpiece a silver helmet with a blue hood draped over it. Link met Muzo at the bottom of the dais, reaching out and taking the clothing which felt much too light to be considered true armor. My daughter made that armor for you, Link, Dory Fan said, his voice growing somber. She finished it while you were still traveling with Princess of Hyrule before the Calamity, but I understand she had a difficult time finding the right time to see that you received it. The bundle of cloth, leather, and silver in his hands took on a new meaning to Link. He looked down at it to inspect it closer and found that he could see that the chest piece had actually been mostly made of interlocking scales, much like a chain mail. Zora scales. He thought as he touched them. The armor was folded in his arms, so it was difficult to see all of the details in the armor, but it looked like a complicated piece of work. Mipha had made this for him? I do not believe she would object to my giving this to you with the hopes that you wear it when you go on to tame the Divine Beast. Link looked up at King Dory Fan, a little stunned by the gift. He thought back to his only true memory of Mipha climbing Ploimus Mountain to defeat the previous Lionel. He had been told of his friendship with Mipha since arriving at Zora's domain, but that memory had awoken something in him that confirmed it. He had been friends with her close friends. This gift, unlike the gifts he received from Telma, which had been in thanks, or from Impa, which had been symbolic, was the gift from one friend to another. It was the only one that Link, currently, had any memory of receiving. It was, perhaps, a little absurd. He barely knew anything about Mipha, but he appreciated this thoughtful act quite a bit, regardless. It was enough to make his heart swell and his throat constrict with emotion. It took Link a moment before he spoke. Thank you, your majesty, he said quietly. I... Yes. Yes, I will wear it. 
of course. Very good, King Dorifan said, nodding in satisfaction. I am sure that she would be pleased if you did. My Mipha, she... He hesitated, seeming to consider whether or not he should say anything. Well, she cared for you. She deeply cared for you. There was something in the king's expression that gave Link a moment of pause. Something that he wasn't telling Link. Something that Link felt as though he should know. What had been between Mipha and him? Thus far, that was all he had seen or heard of, yet it didn't sit quite right with him. He was roused from his thoughts as King Dorifan announced that they were preparing a feast in Link's honor for defeating the Lionel and his eventual taming of Ruta. Link quickly excused himself from the throne room, deciding that he wanted to drop his gear off back at the inn before engaging in a feast. He took the Zora armor made for him by Mipha, still uncertain of what significance it held. He decided to bring it up to Sidon later, if he had the chance. Even though rain still fell from the sky, it was clear that the tribe of Zora had not had occasion to celebrate in some time. While the feast itself took place in the palace, upon tables that had clearly been brought up for Link's benefit, other signs of celebration appeared throughout the city. Several shops announced special sales, while an impromptu diving competition was set up. Link was encouraged to join in, but he respectfully declined. Somehow, he did not think he would be as successful when diving off of the city into the lake below as the Zora were. The evening had grown late by the time Link finally extricated himself from the feast hall, where Cass had been playing songs of ancient Zora heroes, including one song about King Dorifan himself. As Link made his way down the stairs down to the bottom level of Zora's domain, and the bed that awaited him, he was surprised to see Sidon standing in front of the statue of Mipha in the center. Link had thought that Sidon had simply gone to bed. Link approached Sidon, his footsteps splashing through the constant puddle of water. He had finally relented and just taken his boots off, leaving them back in his room, and had rolled his pant legs to his calves. It certainly made it a lot easier to get around in Zora's domain, though the water was chillier than he would have preferred. Sidon looked at Link and smiled pensively before looking back up at the statue. I used to be jealous of you and my sister. Did you know that? Link looked at Sidon, his brow creased slightly, before turning his gaze to the statue. No, I didn't. My memory. Yes, of course, I am sorry, Sidon said quickly, abashed. You act and speak with such confidence that it is easy to forget that you have not yet recovered your memories yet. Confidence? Is that what he sees in me? Link wondered with surprise. He certainly didn't feel confident. If anything, he felt even more certain that he could not succeed where Mipha perished. He had no idea what to expect. He did not know what killed Mipha and the other champions. All he knew was that he had to try. For Mipha. For Princess Zelda. For any number of Hylians, Shika, Zora, Gorons, Garudo, and Rito that were counting on him. No, it's... Fine, Link finally said. Why were you jealous? Sidon remained silent for a long time. Finally, he said, it took me a while to be sure it was you. I do not have many clear memories of my sister, myself, you see. But I have this fuzzy memory of a Hylian swordsman spending time with her. I think I was worried that he was taking her away from me. Link remained silent, and Sidon glanced down at him, smiling. So I suppose I could say that I remember you from 100 years ago as well, vague though the memory might be. Sidon looked back at the statue of Mipha. It's strange to think about how things could have been different. To hear father tell it, you and Mipha would have been wed. You and I would be brothers, in, law. Link started. What? He tore his eyes from the statue, looking again to Sidon. Were we? Sidon laughed, placing a hand on Link's shoulder. Oh, I have no idea, so don't bother asking. What I do know, based on the stories that my father has told me over the years, is that Mipha cared for you. Loved you. That is why she made that armor. You see, that armor is a tradition among Zora royalty. Zora princesses and queens craft armor for their husbands, to be. There is a tale behind it, of course, but suffice it to say that the armor is typically given during an engagement. Their husbands, or betrothed, are expected to wear it into battle as a sign of the love and trust shared between them. So, you see, when my father asked you to wear the armor into battle tomorrow... Sidon sighed softly. Well, it's a symbolic gesture, of course. My father supported my sister's intentions, and this is probably his way of trying to honor her wishes, in a way. Link tried to process this information. 
It was not Mitha's affection for him that bothered him, but it was the lack of knowledge that he had regarding his affections for her. Had he loved her in return? When she died, had he lost a friend or a lover? The fact that he did not know seemed horribly wrong. A disservice. Sidon watched Link as he contemplated. Finally, he spoke again, his tone soft. I apologize if this has caused you some discomfort. That is why my father did not mention it, I believe it. But I felt that you should know why that armor was crafted for you. No, it's not. Link looked up at the statue, at the exquisitely crafted face of Mitha there. I just wish I remembered more. I wish I knew if I felt the same way. Perhaps you soon will, Sidon said, squeezing his shoulder before letting his hand fall. In the meantime, I do think that she would be honored for you to wear the armor. He smiled suddenly. Besides, it will drive Musa mad, and that is always a worthwhile goal. Link could not find it within himself to smile at this comment, and after a moment of silence, he asked the question that had been on his mind since arriving here. Do you know why they blame me? Sidon sighed softly, as if he had been expecting this question. I believe it is because they do not wish to admit that Mipha failed. My sister is held on a pedestal so high that she might as well be infallible. Deific. It is easier to blame you, and your princess, for Mipha's death, rather than admit that she failed in her own duty. Calamity Ganon rose. Many Zora lost their lives in the days that followed his awakening, and my sister was supposed to be an integral part in preventing that. But we all failed, Link said, frowning. All four champions died. I wasn't much better off. It is hardly Mipha's fault that she was killed. Yes, but I believe it also gives them an excuse to keep us isolated in Zora's domain. Rather than venturing out to seek alliances and, perhaps, retake some of the land, we Zora remain relatively protected in our river. But you don't agree? Of course not. And I think that many Zora feel the same way I do. But these are not just my father's closest advisors, but also his military leaders. And, though my father does not blame you for Mipha's death the same way the others do, I do think that he blames the partnership between the races. I believe that he and the others hope that, if we stay here, we will be safe. Sidon sighed, shaking his head, before saying, For being such a long, living people, we can be shockingly short, sighted at times. Mipha, alone, chose her path. She knew its dangers and knew that she had to do her part to not only save the Zora, but to keep the entire land safe. Link thought back to when he and Mipha had gone up Ploimus Mountain together. She had been insistent on going with him, on doing her part. But she had gone up the mountain only because he had chosen to do so. The thought nagged at him. Had her decision to become a champion been the same way? Had she only chosen to do so because he, the man she apparently loved, had also tied himself to that fate? If that was the case, then it was his fault that she died. That thought continued to bother Link that night, even after he and Sidon parted and he lied in bed. The armor haunted him, sitting upon a small table by his bed. Had Mipha's love for him gotten her killed? Finally, the sound of rain outside and the exhaustion of the day overtook him and Link fell into a restless asleep. Link did not dream that night, and when he awoke, he felt as though he had not slept much at all. His entire body felt stiff and sore from the previous day's activities, and his right shoulder, in particular, hurt to move. That did not bode well for his task that day. As he rose, his eyes fell on the armor that had been neatly folded on the small table. He appreciated Sidon's honesty but couldn't help but to wish that the Zora Prince had kept the true purpose of the armor to himself, at least until after Link had dealt with the Divine Beast. It was a distraction that he did not need. The question of his own feelings for Mipha plagued him much of the night. The inn had a screen with which to change behind. Zora typically did not wear clothing, so the need for privacy while changing clothing was lost on them. The privacy screen was there for their non-Zora guests, however. Link appreciated it. He took the Zora armor behind that screen and began to put it on. The Zora armor was quite unlike the tunics he was used to wearing. It was made up of several different components. Its initial layer was a shirt and pants that appeared to be made up of some kind of fabric made with small Zora scales dyed blue, with the exception of one, larger silver scale in the center of the chest, just over where his heart would be. It was incredibly light, and Link wondered at its protective capabilities. It did not seem to be very sturdy. It fit him well, however, without bunching or cinching anywhere. His back, upper arms, and thighs were all protected by another layer of scale armor. This layer was made of thicker, brown scales that had a soft, leathery feel to them. 
pieces of metal had been placed to protect his extremities and the most vulnerable places. Surprisingly thin boots covered his feet, ending in a trio of webbed toes that his own toes slipped into. The gloves were similarly made, with simple webbing between four of his fingers, but none between his thumb and forefinger. Finally, Link placed the helmet on his head. It was made of both a metal cap that protected his forehead and scalp and a layer of Zora scale fabric that hung down behind his head, neck, and the sides of his face. The armor, to Link's amazement, was incredibly light. Even the pieces of metal seemed far lighter than they should have been, and each of these had been clearly crafted and placed with flexibility in mind. Even wearing the various pieces of armor, Link felt like his freedom of movement had not been overly affected. It was clear to him that Mipha had purposely made the armor to complement his fighting style. Link picked up his sword and tested his mobility in the center of the room, going through a few exercises with it in hand. The armor clung to him like a second skin, never getting in the way of his movements. The pieces of metal were silent as well, never clattering together or shifting uncomfortably. Link finally finished off his exercise with a quick backflip, landing easily on his feet. Wow, Linny! Koda, the female Zora innkeeper, had stepped into the room from the entryway there were no doorways and she had probably been able to see him the entire time. Link felt his cheeks grow hot with a blush. Sorry, I was just testing out the... That's the armor that Mipha made for you, isn't it? Koda asked, stepping closer and inspecting his appearance. Link nodded, suddenly curious about what she knew of the armor. She worked for weeks making it. Koda made a circle around Link, nodding with a smile. She would be happy to see you wearing it now. She wanted so badly to give it to you but never could work up the courage. She wanted to ask me to marry her? Link asked, hesitant. Koda laughed softly. Oh, someone already informed you of that, I take it? Well, yes. That was her hope. The Zora paused, looking out of the open wall, into the distance. It took her a long time to gather all of the supplies, and once she had them, she refused to let anyone help her. It all had to be done by her hand, as was tradition. Even the silver scale. Koda poked Link's chest, where the silvery scale was. That is Mipha's own scale. Link reached up, touching the scale, frowning. It looks good on you, Linny, Koda said, stepping back. She smiled warmly at Link. I know she would be proud. Distantly, Link heard the call of a horn. Koda stiffened, looking around in surprise. Link stepped up next to her. What does that mean? It's a call to battle. Koda said absently. I haven't heard it in ages, though. Not since the calamity. Link moved quickly, gathering up the supplies he had set aside for the Divine Beast. His sword and shield, his bow and shock arrows, the Sheikah Slate. Koda helped him strap the equipment to his body. Mipha had clearly thought of this as well and had provided ways to strap his sword and shield to his back with ease, as well as places to carry his bow and arrows. Finally, thanking Koda, Link sprinted out of the inn, passing by Finley, Koda's daughter, who rushed inside to be with her mother. Link! Sidon called, just as Link exited the inn. The Zora ran up to him, holding his spear. It's the Lizalfos. Somehow, they made it all the way up the river during the night. None of our scouts reported them. Link gritted his teeth. How close are they? I'll help, I can. There's no time for that, Sidon said, cutting him off. We just got a report from the dam. It's been sabotaged. We think that someone used explosive charges to create weaknesses in its structural integrity. It's leaking, and it could break soon. Our architects are doing what they can to slow it, but as long as it's raining like this, they won't be able to slow it enough to fix it. We have to get you to the Divine Beast immediately to try to shut it down. I was coming down to tell you when the Lizalfos were spotted. Everything fell into place. The rain, the sabotage, the Lizalfos, and maybe even the Lynil. These were not random, or even separate, events. This had been a planned maneuver. Link looked up at Sidon and saw, from the prince's strained expression, that he realized it too. Their eyes met. Let's go, Link said. Sidon nodded, and the two of them headed off to the same bridge they had taken the day before. The journey to the East Reservoir Dam took the better part of two hours. Link could tell that Sidon was worried about his soldiers fighting the Lizalfos without him, but when Link offered that someone else could help him with the Divine Beast, he shook his head. This is something that I have to do, he said, without any further explanation.
The East Reservoir Dam stood over them like a monolith, but they wasted no time admiring its architecture, which bore a great deal of resemblance to the bridges. Instead, Sidon and Link found the staircase that led to its top and began to climb. Sidon ran up them three steps at a time, leaving Link to struggle to keep up. Finally, they reached the top of the dam. In normal circumstances, there would have been a walkway at the top of the dam, with stairs that led down to lower levels for access to its controls. The heavy rain, however, had caused the water level to rise and completely cover the walkway and flood the interior, even threatening to begin pouring over the dam's lip. As they waded out into the water, Link looked out across the lake and saw, in its center, the distant divine beast. Its trunk was still pointed to the sky, and a cloud of mist and water sprayed out from it, forming the dark clouds overhead. It was positioned in the center of the lake, which almost 20 miles wide at its widest point. Link would have no way to reach it alone. Okay, Link, Sidon said, wading into the water until he reached the end of the submerged stone walkway. The water grew far deeper here, giving it a much darker appearance. You'll have to ride on my back while I swim. When we get closer, it is going to start trying to attack us. You'll need to just hold on when that happens, and I'll do my best to get you close enough to use the arrows. Sidon hesitated. Try not to shoot the water with them. I don't know how far the electricity will travel. Link nodded and approached Sidon, the water up to his knees. It seemed like it was already rising how much longer before the dam broke? Was there enough time? It doesn't matter, he told himself. I still have to try. Sidon waded out into the deep water, treading water easily, and Link followed. He had expected his gear to weigh him down but was shocked to find that he felt light in the water. He was able to tread water effortlessly, regardless of the weaponry on his back. It was surreal enough that he checked his back to make sure that everything was still there, but yes, he had everything. He wasn't sure if this was an effect of the armor or the Zora weaponry he carried. Perhaps both. Either way, he was grateful for it. Are you ready? Sidon asked, moving closer to him and turning so that his back was to Link. Do I really have a choice? Link said dryly. Sidon looked back at Link and grinned. Not at all. Then I'm ready. Link moved closer and placed his hands on Sidon's shoulders. Sidon eased himself onto his stomach, and Link, somewhat uncomfortably, straddled Sidon's back. As soon as Link's grip was secure, Sidon took off. He swam through the water at a blistering pace, his arms to his side, feet doing the majority of the propelling. They moved fast enough through the placid lake that the falling rain stung Link's exposed face. Link bounced on Sidon's back, doing everything he could to hold on, lest he fall. How was he supposed to shoot arrows like this? They crossed the lake far faster than Link had thought possible. In only minutes' time, they were close enough for Link to begin making out some of the details on Divine Beast Varuda, which only grew larger and larger as they drew near. It was massive. Elephantine in shape, with four massive legs that somehow kept it above the depths of the lake, a thick, cylindrical body, a head with two large ear-like protrusions, and a long, segmented trunk. It was entirely mechanical in nature, covered in gears and strange, red-purple lights. Something on its body always seemed to be moving, spinning, or hissing steam. Without a doubt, it was ancient Sheikah in nature, its body made of the same combination of metal and stone that all of the other Sheikah structures had been made of, with Sheikah designs carved into it. Link, do you see the glowing sections on her back, just above her legs? Sidon asked as they got closer. He began to swim in a wide circle around Ruta, slowing his speed, which Link was grateful for. He was still far enough away that the Divine Beast did not react to their presence, as he had told Link it would as they got closer. It took Link a moment, as the Divine Beast had quite a few glowing sections on its body, but he thought that he found them. He could see four glowing spots of red light, held within stone enclosures that protruded out of the Divine Beast's back, just above its legs. The schematics that we have for Ruta suggest that many of her functions are tied to those spots. Sidon slowed further, looking back at Link to make sure he understood. If you can hit all four of them with the shock arrows, we think that it may shut her down. At least, that's what we hope for. The targets were, from what Link could tell at this distance, large enough that hitting one with an arrow should not be so difficult in normal circumstances. Of course, straddling Sidon's back as he was, this was hardly a normal circumstance. Are you ready? Sidon looked back at him, and at Link's nod, he grinned, showing his teeth. Then let's go. Sidon kicked off, angling directly for the Divine Beast. Link pulled his bow free it was a newer bow of Zora design, which was made to be used in wet climates. It was made of the same silvery metal as their other weapons. 
he wasn't sure about its design, feeling convinced that its range would not be as good as that of his Sheikah Bao. At least it would not get damaged from the rain, though. The divine beast made a trumpeting sound, and Sidon called back, It's noticed us. Link looked up and saw that the divine beast had turned in the water, placing its side to them. Hold on, Link. Link watched in some amazement as the water next to the divine beast rose into the air, taking shape. There was a sudden and familiar series of cracking noises that rang out, as the water froze solid, sending out a puff of ice crystals and snow that quickly disappeared in the rain. Where the water had been moments before, now there were jagged shards of ice, each the length of a man's arm. It must really not like you. Sidon called as the first ice spike shot forward, straight at Link. He turned in the water, forcing Link to lean low to prevent himself from being thrown off. The ice spike passed harmlessly by, plunging into the depths of the water. Usually, it just throws blocks of ice at any Zora that get nearby. Ruta sent another ice spike at the pair of them, and Sidon made another hard turn. The ice spike flew by, immediately followed by a second one. As the Divine Beast created another set of ice spikes, Link was certain that it was using the Cryonis rune somehow. It made sense, though these Divine Beasts were made by the same people who made his Sheikah Slate, after all. I need you to get closer. Link said, looking away from the floating ice spikes and to the glowing notes on the construct's back. I'm trying. Sidon turned, swimming straight for the Divine Beast. As an ice spike shot towards them, he adjusted his course just enough that the spike passed by Link's shoulder without striking him. It came far closer than before, though. Link ducked his head as another spike flew past. As soon as it passed, he sat back up, knocked an arrow, and drew. At once, he felt the muscles in his arm clench as the shock arrow activated. It was not as severe of a shock as the Lizalfo's arrow had been, however better made arrows, perhaps. It was enough, however, to cause Sidon beneath him to gasp, shuddering. Are you all right? Link said, looking down at him in concern. He hadn't expected the arrow's feedback to transfer through him to Sidon. Yes. Sidon said, gritting his teeth. Do it. Link pursed his lips and looked forward again, holding on to Sidon with his knees. Cracks sounded through the air as Ruta created more ice spikes. He sighted down the length of the bow, trying to keep his aim as steady as possible while riding a giant fish man. Unfortunately, as he launched the sparking arrow, he knew immediately that his aim had been poor. Instead of striking the glowing node, the arrow hit the divine beast's side with a burst of electric energy. Though Ruta seemed to shudder slightly, and it trumpeted again, the arrow did nothing to stop the onslaught of water and ice. That's okay. Sidon turned, swimming past the divine beast's front to its other side. Try again. Link drew another arrow, again feeling the shock in his arm. Sidon flinched beneath him. Their maneuver around the Divine Beast had briefly slowed its defenses, as it now had to create additional ice spikes on its opposite side. This gave them a small window during which Sidon slowed his pace some, allowing Link to take better aim. This arrow streaked through the air, sparking with yellow lightning, and struck home. It hit the red node with a blast of lightning. The entire Divine Beast shuddered as electricity coursed around the light, causing it to flicker, and then fade completely. Link watched with excitement as the water spraying out of the trunk halted as well. That's it, Link. Sidon called. Hurry, try to hit the other. His voice was suddenly cut off as he was forced to make a sharp turn, nearly unseating Link in the process. A massive wall of ice had suddenly formed with a sharp crack directly in front of them. As they turned away from the Divine Beast, swimming alongside the ice wall, Link heard several ice spikes splash into the water right behind them. It's trying to box us in. Sidon said, his voice suddenly tight. He was right. The wall of ice formed a curve ahead, forcing Sidon to turn back the way they had come. As Link looked around, he saw that the ice was being created far faster than Sidon could swim. It was forming a circle around them, trapping them within. Sidon could, perhaps, jump it on his own, or even swim under it, if it did not extend all the way down, but with Link on his back. Hold on, Link said, slinging the bow over his shoulder. Swim towards the ice. Going off of a hunch, he pulled the Sheikah slate off of his belt. Sidon did as he suggested, swimming towards the ice, though at a slower pace now. He looked back at Link uncertainly. Link ignored him for the moment and pressed the Cryonis rune icon, lifting the Sheikah slate as the screen turned translucent, highlighting all of the water with bright blue light. He found the ice wall in his view screen, which was highlighted red. He pressed his finger to the Cryonis rune again. A section of the ice wall splintered, crumbling, and falling into the lake. 
How, Sidon said with amazement as they burst out of the Divine Beast's trap. Link ignored his query, however, as he put the Sheikah slave away again and drew his bow. They were further than he'd have liked, but he knocked an arrow anyway. Beneath him, Sidon grunted in pain. Sidon? Link said, looking down at his companion. He noticed then that Sidon's skin, normally a deep red, had grown paler. I'm fine. Sidon looked back at Link, his expression grim. Just keep going. Seeing no other way, Link did as Sidon said, drawing the arrow to his cheek. He waited until just the right moment before releasing the arrow. It sailed through the air, striking high on the red node, which started sparking immediately. The divine beast trumpeted again, and Link thought it sounded more desperate now somehow. Overhead, the rain had begun to lessen. It's working. Sidon yelled as he began to loop around the backside of Ruta. Keep going, I can handle it. Link didn't draw another arrow, though, keeping an eye out for the next counter-attack. It did not immediately come, however, which confused Link. Had the second node shut down its ability to defend itself? The Divine Beast launched no ice spikes, nor did it put up another wall to entrap them. Finally, Link began to draw another arrow when he heard a splash behind them, barely audible over Sidon's own splashing. He looked back and yelled out in surprise at what he saw, a mere arm's length behind Sidon's feet. It was a giant ball of ice, rolling through the water at a blistering pace. The ball was covered with vicious-looking spikes, making it look like the giant head of a morning star. Behind you! Link cried. Sidon reacted without looking, turning to the side just in time. The spiked ice ball rolled past in the water, but Link didn't have time to breathe a sigh of relief. He watched in horror as the spiked ball turned in the water, riding itself, and pursuing them once again. It was gaining rapidly. Link drew another arrow, ignoring Sidon's reaction, and launched the arrow at the ball of ice. It had the desired effect, causing the spike ball to crack and crumble into the water with a splash. However, to Link's dismay, it was not alone. Another spiked ball followed right behind it, churning through the waters. The pieces of ice left over from the previous attack did not even slow it. He stowed the bow again, pulling out his Sheikah slate. Quickly navigating back to the Cryonis rune, he highlighted the ball and destroyed it right before it overtook them. Relieved, Link looked back towards the Divine Beast. There's more coming, Sidon said warningly. There was no need Link had already seen them. Three more spiked balls of ice directly in their path to the Divine Beast and crossing the distance rapidly. Aim for the center and speed up, Link said, holding the slate up to highlight the center sphere. The three spiked balls raced across the water towards them, forming a wall of spikes that would likely grind them down, if Link timed this wrong. Too late and the ice wouldn't break apart in time, but too early and the other two could close the gap before they got through. Link. Keep going. The rolling spikes loomed, filling the screen of the Sheikah slate. Link. Now. Link pressed the cryonis icon and the center spiked ball shattered, crumbling into the water. The two outer spheres immediately began to close the gap, but Sidon darted through the opening. Link felt floating pieces of ice bounce off of his greaves. Behind them, the two spiked balls crashed into each other with a sharp cracking noise. Link immediately drew his bow and arrow, taking aim, and launching another shock arrow at the third node. The reaction in the Divine Beast as the arrow found its target was immediate. The entire construct shuddered and the red lights that covered its body flickered before steadying. They were definitely dimmer now, though. One more. Sidon said through gritted teeth. Link pulled another arrow from his quiver, readying himself to take aim. The water in front of them became a sheet of ice. Hold on. Sidon cried as he banked away. It was too late, however, and Link lost his grip, flying off of Sidon onto the ice. He rolled, losing his grip on the silver bow, which slid away from him. Watch out! Sidon's voice saved him. He rolled just as an ice spike slammed down into the sheet of ice, nearly impaling him. He leaped to his feet, grateful to see that the Zora boots he wore did grip the ice slightly better than his normal boots would have. He broke into an unsteady sprint, barely dodging out of the way of another spike. As he ran towards the fallen silver bow, he did a quick inventory. He still had the quiver attached to his hip. That was the most important thing. The Sheikah slate was still attached as well on the opposite hip. Good. He glanced towards Ruta, eyes widening as he saw several more spikes forming. It attacked with a renewed ferocity, ignoring Sidon completely now and focusing everything on Link. 
he felt a spike glance off of his armor and winced, stumbling. Another spike passed by just in front of him. Link dropped into a slide, fingers reaching and grasping the silver bow. Another two spikes sailed just overhead. He leaped just as the ice beneath him ran out. As he sailed through the air, he pulled a shock arrow from its quiver. Time seemed to slow. The only sound that Link could hear was his own breathing and the creak of the bow as he drew the arrow to his cheek. He took aim. The arrow sparked to life. He released the arrow and crashed down into the water. The electrified arrow flew through the air and struck the final glowing red note in its center. The divine beast trumpeted once more as the red lights all over its body flickered rapidly and then died. Its trunk, limp, crashed down to the water. The ice that it created began to crack and break apart. Once the ice had broken apart enough, Sidon swam through the gap to rejoin Link, who was treading water and watching Ruta's shutdown. Overhead, the rain stopped. Link looked up and saw the clouds, which had been in a strange swirling pattern, begin to break apart, letting sunlight stream down. It was nearly blinding after being in the gloom of rain for the last several days. We did it, Sidon said, his voice in awe. He looked at Link, eyes widening, his lips splitting into a grin. Link, we did it. The rain has stopped. This is wonderful. Link breathed a sigh of relief, allowing himself a smile. Suddenly, however, the divine beast lurched back to life. Link's heart sank as he watched the red lights flicker back on. Its legs extended further, slowly lifting its body out of the water of the lake. He saw the expression on Sidon's face and imagined that it mirrored his own. It wasn't enough. The rain had been stopped, but he had not yet saved the divine beast. He had not yet removed Ganon's influence the thing that had killed Mipha. No, for that. Sidon, I need to get inside of it, he said, gritting his teeth. Sidon looked over at him, eyes meeting his, and nodded. I know where the entrance is. Link climbed onto Sidon's back, and the prince took off again, circling around the divine beast. Link kept watch, making sure that the divine beast's defenses wouldn't come back online. As they swam, Sidon spoke softly. I've never been inside. None of us have. Not since my sister. His eyes were locked on Ruta. Link could not see his face, but he could hear longing in his voice. It never allowed us to get this close, you see. It was never that aggressive, but it would still protect itself. We just learned to give it a wide berth. How do you know where the entrance is? Link asked, curious. He hadn't seen any sign of an entrance as they were swimming around it earlier, but Sidon had spoken of the schematics before. I remember watching my sister disappear inside of it. Silence fell between them for a time before, finally, Sidon spoke again. Link, I... I cannot stay with you. You need to go to your soldiers, Link said, guessing what he was going to say. Sidon looked back at him, surprised. Yes. I do. If they still fight the Lizalfos, my place will be by their side. He looked back towards the Divine Beast. He was swimming towards a platform extending from its side that sat just above the water. Link hadn't seen it before but supposed that it might have been submerged before its body had been lifted out of the water. I wish I could accompany you. For my sister. But I must obey my duty, as you must obey yours. Link remained silent. He could tell that this was a hard decision for him to make. Most likely, he had hoped that he could enter the Divine Beast with Link. He would have, if it wasn't for the Lizalfo attack. Sidon swam up to the platform, and Link climbed onto it. He checked his gear one last time, verifying that he still had everything that he needed. When he was satisfied, he looked down to Sidon, who was smiling up at him. Best of luck, Sidon said, his voice more jovial than it was a moment ago. Show the enemy no fear, Link. Tonight, we will celebrate in Zora's domain as victors and saviors of the land. I'm still not going to eat any raw trout tonight, Link said, smiling. Sidon laughed and began to swim backwards. I will make sure to have a fire made so you can cook your own, then. He lifted a hand in farewell. Finish the job, Link. I believe in you. Sidon turned and began swimming away at a rapid pace, a streak in the water. Link watched him go. Finally, once he was certain that Sidon made it to the side of the lake, Link turned to face the entrance of the Divine Beast. To his surprise, Mipha stood in the entrance, looking at him with a warm smile. Hello, Link. End of chapter